All right. There's some things here that we're going to make intelligent guesses on exactly what's meant. And I say that because that's what the commentators do on some of these things. They make intelligent guesses what is meant by some of that. And so uh, we're going to have to do the same thing. First, in real quick review, verses 9 through 16. Let not a widow be taken into the number under 60 years old. That's what three score years means. Having been the wife of one man. Um, now we'd already studied, uh, well we get from that a note, to qualify for this benevolence. And you know I thought later, it's not really a benevolence, I'll explain here in a minute. To qualify for this benevolence, widows have to be at least 60. The wife of one man and full of good works. Now, Albert Barnes gave three guesses what the husband of one man could be. It meant that she never had more than one husband at a time. In other words, she wasn't a bigamist. It could mean she was only married one time to one man, and there was one other, I forget his other uh, guess. We don't know exactly what's meant there. But I'm guessing it means that uh, I don't think God would penalize someone. Jesus gave a reason for divorce and remarriage, which was uh, of sexual misconduct. And uh, so I can't imagine if a woman had been married to, a Christ, uh, to someone she thought to be a Christian and he left her and she later got a divorce and, and she married someone else. I don't think that would disqualify her myself, just because um, Paul's writings are pretty um, pretty plain. I, I, I can't remember the book and chapter right now, but uh, he said a, a brother or sister is not under bondage in such case. And uh, what was the case? The case was if your husband died. That's why there were churches at one time that taught if you're divorced, you can only remarry if your mate, your former mate, died. Um, but what it does say, if the unbelieving depart, and if you're a Christian and you took vows before God and you depart, you're an unbeliever of those vows. You might believe in God, but you don't believe the vows you took. And later on in that chapter, it said a brother or sister is not under bondage in that case. What was the bondage? He was talking about the bondage of marriage. When you're bound to another person, you're not free to marry someone else. And so they said, if the unbeliever depart, let him depart. The brother or sister, the remaining spouse that got left, uh, is not under bondage. So I, um, I don't think if uh, your husband or wife leaves you uh, and you were determined to do what God said and spend the rest of your life with that person and they left you. We, in America, we have no fault of the Lord. I believe the Bible is saying you're not under any bondage of that kind. And the entire chapter is about the bondage of marriage. Not bondage in a bad way. You are bound together. And he said you're not under bondage. So uh, I'm guessing it's talking about uh, if she was married more than once, both um, Either her first husband left her, would have had to have been on the first husband's head, or he died. And so then she married again, and then was widowed. And said, you can't be in this program, I'll explain that in a moment, but you can't be in this program unless you're at least 60, because Paul said the ones under 60 are going to make this vow to God, and then they're going to see some guy wink at them and change their mind. Barb was determined to be um, forever unmarried, but I winked at her and <laughs> pretty much did it. But uh, anyway, they, it's odd that Paul, who was not married, how Paul brought this up, said, um, these widows, if they're younger, they're going to want to marry again. So here's what he was fighting against. He didn't want them to make a vow to God. This widow's indeed involved making a vow to God. 
I will serve you, you are now my husband. Um, and so it's not that you're going to go to hell if you break that vow. But the Bible is very plain. You should not make vows or promises to God you're not going to keep. And always remember this, folks. Now, this was not unusual circumstances. I've always told people, there's no power in your promise. The power is in God's promise to you. Right. I'm a new creature. That's God's promise to me. That's where the power is. I can fail God this week, kneel down, uh, and say, God, forgive me, I, I failed, I'm so sorry, I'll never do it again. There's no power in those words, I'll never do it again. There is power in His words. I'm a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. That's where the power is at. So, getting people to feel guilty and coming up to make promises to God is not the answer to anything. The answer is to get them to believe the promises God made to them. Because that's where the power is in God's creative promises, not in you and I making vows. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that, that's the idea. I'm not going to spend any more time on this, but uh, we're going to jump into today's lesson. Concerning church leaders. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Let me read that in another translation, the E did a read version. The elders who lead the church in a good way should receive double honor, in particular those who do the work of counseling and teaching. Good news Bible. The elders who do good work as leaders should be consi considered worthy of receiving double pay especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. Now I got good news for you. We don't have to worry about this because you can double my pay, you can quadruple my, my pay, you can give me 10 times what I'm currently getting and it won't cost the church one penny because I'm currently getting nothing. And no matter how many, what number you multiply nothing by, it remains nothing. So you can increase my wage 10 times and I'd still be getting nothing. But I don't think, there are commentators, and I tend to agree with them, the double portion they have in mind here is for its specific elders here, in general means church leaders. It could be anything from board members to whatever. But here he singles out especially those that preach and teach the word. So he's talking about preachers here. The double portion seems, to, the, uh, of the commentaries I looked at, the one that makes the most sense to me is, I mean, give the preachers that labor hard to teach the word twice as much as you give the widows indeed. Because that's the only other group we're reading about is widows indeed. And so the twice, the double portion, has to be two times something. And the only something there that we can double is whatever the church pays these widows indeed. And remember, widows indeed, the church wasn't like social security or the church wasn't like welfare. Um, these women took vows to God to serve in the church. And they would, you, you read expressions like they pray day and night. They visit the sick. So they were extensions of the church. And as extensions of the church, they paid them. And that's how they made their living, because their husbands were dead, and they had nobody to support them. Now, again, Paul encouraged, if you have living family members, let them take care of you. Because even though they're going to take care of the widows indeed, how many can they take care of? That's always an issue. How many can you bring into the fold and, and keep having enough money to pay them? So um, remember this is the local church that Timothy's preaching at that if Paul is telling these things to. So he says, whenever possible, let the family take care of them. They can still serve the Lord if they want, but as far as the money is concerned, let the families take care of them, the surviving family. So here they're saying, 
in this area of support, preachers of the word and sound doctrine should get twice. And again, I don't see any other thing that where he mentioned money, so double portion to me means whatever it is you're paying the widows indeed, for the elders who are the actual preachers, they should get a double portion. Double portion was a big thing among the Jews, you know, in the after the uh, covenant God made to Abraham, the firstborn got a double portion. That means if there's five children, you divided the inheritance six ways. Five children, you divide the inheritance six ways. Why? Because the oldest gets two of them, and the other four get one each. So they total six. So you had to go for your sons. Back in those days, it was the sons who got the money. Um, so back in those days, the oldest got a double portion. Well, that's what they're talking about here. Um, but this time, uh, the double portion of the Old Testament was twice what the other heirs get. The double portion in this story we're reading about seems to be twice what the widows receive as pay. So the widows become church staff and um, but Paul said remember to honor Timothy um, the leaders of the church and Timothy was the leader of that church so the ministerial elders of the church would have received financial blessings I, I've gotten under here what is this verse teaching us the answer the ministerial elders of the church would have received financial blessing as they are faithful to preach the word and teach doctrine. Certainly all of us preachers would like to be honored in the sense of being respected by the church. But the subject at hand in this lesson is money. So we have talked for two weeks about widows indeed receiving financial sustenance, and now the very subject is turned toward the ministers of the gospel. This church, going back to its beginning, the ones we're at at the Good News Worship Center, has always done its best to honor me in this fashion. When the church was larger, I received more fi financial support. When when we were running over a hundred on Fifth Avenue, we were making more money than we made at Full Gospel, the church of 300. Um, we were really, um, when we were small, smaller in the old senior center, they paid me so much and I challenged the board, because it wasn't a living wage, challenged the board, keep paying me this, this amount, up to 4000 the church taking in $4,000 a month. Once it takes four, everything over four, until I get a living wage, pay me half of everything over four. Man, I got some checks. Again, full gospel, we had 300 on Sunday morning, and I didn't get those checks. Uh, but we were doing good, but then the church split, uh, and uh, once that happened, um, then uh, the money started going down, and we ended up having to sell the church. And But I made, initially, my salary was $1,250 a month, um, which is three something a week. And, um, and that's what I made until the church brought in at least uh, 4000 what's that, did I say $4,000? And then I got half of everything above. And uh, so for a while we were doing pretty good. And, and then of course the church split, and when there was less people, there was less offering, when there was less offering. Um, now when we sold that building, we banked a lot of money. And because we banked a lot of money, I was able to get my 1250 a month for quite a while. And so, uh, for we've been in this building a long time. For quite a while, I got my 1250 a month. But as time went on, and the, uh, people kept dying off on us, let people put money in the offering, it's probably been six or seven years since I've taken any money from the church. Um, so, 
Yeah. What's that? We've never taken money here. There we go. I mean, yeah, I do, I do the taxes. Yeah, I, I had to claim my money from you. Uh, yeah, I'm going to check. I got my taxes from seven years ago. I'm going to print it out and see if I got any money then. Once in a while, I got in the bind and would take two or three hundred dollars. And uh, I'd have to include that in my taxes. And, um, but as far as, uh, you know, 1250 a month is 15,000 a year. That's the most, uh, I've ever made at Walk of Grace uh, with 15000 a year. And that's before we were retired. We had no Social Security coming in or anything. So we tightened our belts. But my point is, it was never the issue of the church not wanting to honor us this way. It was an issue there weren't enough people in the church given because the people kept dying. And that's rude. That's just rude. You die, I'm going to call you rude, Daryl. <laughs> Getting old is no reason to die. And uh, that's what we've had. Uh, you know, we've been in old church for quite a while. And um, about the only people who weren't over 60 in this church most of the time probably were my kids. And uh, so people die. And when people die, uh, their offerings don't come in anymore. Um, and so, consequently, it's put us in the situation we're in. But it's not because the church is stingy, it's because the church has no money. Um, we got to get this building paid off, that would help a little, but um, nonetheless, let me take a look at this. So he's saying they're worthy of honor, and again, I'm going to tell you, I think most preachers agree with me. This is talking about financial uh, support. Paul said, don't I have the right to be supported in my ministry by the folk? I'm wording this in my own language. Uh, but he said, don't I have the right like Cephas, or we better know him as Peter. Simon, Peter Simon, Simon Peter, rather. Uh, Peter had a wife who traveled in the ministry with him. He said, don't I have the right to be supported by the ministry like Peter? Don't I have the right to lead a wife around like Peter? Uh, well, he didn't have one to lead around. So it's hard to do that if you're not married. But he's saying that he did not want to be a burden and he had he, uh, a skill set, making tents that they sold to caravans and different things. And him and his team, in most cases, supported themselves by working with their hands. Even though he had the right, he made that clear, he wanted everybody to know when he wrote that, I have a right to be supported by the ministry just like Peter does. He's not saying Peter doesn't have the right. He's acknowledging Peter has the right. And he said, I do too, but I don't want to be a bird. And so he had the ability with his hands to make money, and he did that. Now, uh, there were a handful of churches that supported him, like the uh, Philippians, um, but a lot of the times he had to earn his own way. And he had a team, so you have to be successful in making money to pay the whole team. So he's saying, um, and what I'm telling you here is that the subject at hand is money. Now God has blessed us even when the church shrunk some. Two cars back. Now this is this lesson was initially in 2016. So it's think back 2016 for this comment. Two cars back. We drove a Chevy Malibu that we didn't pay a penny for. A group of our parishioners led by Jeff Kuba bought the car for us, bought it from his brother who uh, redid wrecked cars. And we drove that car for six or seven years to we paid for. Then the next car, at the time I initially made this lesson, our current car, it was our first HHR. 
Well, the gift from a couple in the church whose permission to name them has not been given to me, but they're one of them is dead now and the other we never see, so it's Jack and Deanna. Jack and Deanna bought us our first H.A. shot. And so we had two cars in a row that we never had to make payments on. So that's kind of nice. Uh, we drove it for six years. That means we have not had, at the time I initially made this lesson, for, we've not had a car payment for 12 or 13 years. So we thank all of them. We are honored to be your pastoral team. And it was a blessing. Uh, has always been that way. He's always been a giver. And Jack is really, that's at his core. That, that was at his core. He liked to give when he could. And so, uh, We don't have a car payment now. Um, we had enough money after them getting a check for our last HHR being destroyed in, in a car accident. Um, we had enough to buy another $4,000 car. So we paid for this one, but again, we don't have a car payment. We haven't had a car payment for a really, really long time now. And we thank the Lord for that. All right, put that thing over. Verse 18. For the scripture says, the scripture always amazes me. This is Paul talking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. The translation called God's Word translation says, after all, the scripture says, never muzzle an ox when it's threshing grain. What does that mean? The ox gets to eat while he's working. You don't muzzle him, you let him eat the grain. And the worker deserves his pay. So uh, that's a more modern translation of verse 18. So what he's saying is, preacher, he didn't live by this himself. Maybe he didn't live by this himself because he wanted people to realize in future generations he didn't write this for his benefit. He supplied most of his own income. But he wanted us to know that uh, whenever possible, preachers ought to be paid. And, um, and again, there's a lot of small churches in America lot of small churches and with people probably a lot of them like ours um, people have died and uh, people keep coming and as the, as the thing uh, shrinks now we're going to get into another order of business verse 19 against an elder remember an elder is a church leader the double portion belonged to the preaching elders the pastor, the assistant pastor, whatever. But now he's talking to elders in general. Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. There's always going to be someone mad at an elder. And so, said, don't believe someone because they come and tell you what Daryl did. I'm picking on Daryl today. <laughs> Don't, don't believe them. They said that in order to even consider an accusation against a church leader, there must be two or three witnesses that can verify what the gentleman is or lady who's accusing someone is saying. So I'm not sure you can take that two ways. The accusation comes from one person so you can say, there's that person, but now you got to have two or three confirm that, which would be the way I took it. Mm -hmm. Others might say, no, no, the accused is one of the two or three. Uh, I don't know. I would tend to say, since they're talking about accusation, that the accused is separate, and now he must have two or three people who will verify his story. And... So that's before we make accusations public against a leader, a church leader. So, verse 20, 
them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. I put another translation, God's Word, uh, so you understand from this translation, it still seems to be talking about the leaders. Somebody in leadership in the church sinning. So the God's Word rendering is reprimand those leaders who sin. Do it in front of everyone so that the other leaders may also be afraid. So you need to have a sound reason against a leader of the church. Because a lot of people just don't like people. And you don't want someone who just doesn't like a certain leader of the church. You don't want everything to rest on his or her work. So there needs to be other people backing up the story. Now, that's the good news. Here's the bad news. Many churches in America have cliques. They have cliques of group, groups, uh, five, six, seven, eight close friends. And if you want to get rid of a board member, you want to get rid of an assistant pastor, whatever, one of you could accuse and you could probably talk every one of your friends into verifying it. I had a good friend at work, Roy, uh, having seen he had a stroke and had to quit. And I only seen him once after a stroke, never seen him since. I tried to find out if he's still alive, I don't know. Uh, but good guy, loved him. But he wanted to get his pastor at the Nazarene Church on 23rd Avenue by him. And I thought, man, I love you, I want you in my church. <laughs> you know, if, uh, if you're gonna, he called the headquarters, the Nazarene headquarters, and they came and talked to everybody, and they said, no, we don't have enough weed for the pilot. Um, but I thought, Man, if that's your ambition in life, is to get a preacher fired, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, keep going there <laughs> with my mentality. Keep going there. But nonetheless, so you, you've got to have sound reason. Now look at down here at Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17. Now this isn't just leaders, this is any Christian. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee. We don't use that word much today. If your neighbor, if your brother should do you wrong, should sin against you. We don't even use that word. Forgiven. I mean, when we're outside of church, we just say, he did me wrong. Right? Yeah, I, and that's what this is talking about here. Forgive him. If thy brother do you wrong or trespass against thee, Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So if your brother, a friend in the church or whatever, has done you wrong, the first thing isn't to go to the pastor. The first thing is to go to the one you're offended with and talk it over with him. Now some people draw a line in the sand and say, I said it and I meant it. Not sorry. And then what do you do? Verse 16. If he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. That we're back to having two or three witnesses again. And so now your brother's done you wrong. You went to him. He doesn't receive you. So now you take some Christian friends. Now, in verse 16, it says one or two witnesses, or two or three witnesses with you. Uh, here's the thing. In other words, they're, they're not witnessing what he's accused you of. They're witnessing you trying to reconcile with them. And he said, now, if he still won't do it, what's the final step? If he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. And if he neglect the ear of the church, let him be unto the ear of the heathen man and Republican. Uh, Republican. And publican, I'll get it right. Um, so there is a, there's a general rule of thumb how to deal with disagreements in a church that we probably don't adhere much to today. Uh, and probably should. But because it's scripture. 
So the idea, Galatians 6, 1, right under Matthew 18, gives a little more insight in what's necessary in this. Somebody did you wrong, you went to him, he rejected you. You took uh, two or three others with you, he rejected. You took him before the church, he rejected what the church had to say. Look at Galatians 6, 1. If a man be overtaken in a fall, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. What he's, what's he's adding to it, our discussion here? you got to be spiritual. If you're political, and I don't mean Democrat or Republican, I mean factions in the church. You like this group, and somebody else likes that group in the church. If you're political in that way, you shouldn't be involved in that. You should take someone who's spiritual. How spiritual? So spiritual that they understand if not for the grace of God, I could have done that. That's how spiritual. You consider yourself lest you also be tempted. When we're getting into all these ideas of accusations and how to deal with them, we've got to keep Galatians 6, 1 in mind. The people doing these things need to be spiritual. They need to be head over heels in love with Christ, not just say they are. Probably 90% of everybody in any evangelical church would tell you they're head over heels in love with Christ, but they wouldn't do that. They want to get the other guy, they want to get the other guy. And God is not fond of that in any way, shape, or form. Now verse 20 up there, then that sin rebuke before all. Here's some other translation. Tell those who sin that they are wrong. Do this in front of the whole church so that others will have a warning. Reprimand those leaders. So that, uh, that this translation believes he's still talking to church about church leaders. Reprimand those leaders who sin. Do it in front of everyone so that the other leaders will also be afraid. 2 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11. Important verses. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. What's that saying? What is repentance? Repentance, you're going this way, you turn around and go this way. You change directions. Repentance means I'm living for myself, I'm living in sin, now I want to serve God. I, we put words to it. We say things like, God, I'm so sorry. I'm a sinner. Save me. I want to live for you. But now, real repentance turns you around. Godly sorrow, not so much. So what does he say here? Godly sorrow. I mean, godly sorrow is good. Um, but the sorrow of the world, rather. The godly sorrow is what leads you to repentance to salvation not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. If you're just sorry because of how it's affecting you, you're not going to change directions. It's when you're sorry that you offended God that you change direction. So we have to understand when we're dealing with people, we have to be honest enough to understand if not for the grace of God, I could be tempted to do something like that person just did. And so when I deal with them, I have to deal with them with that understanding. I'm not better than they are. We're both Christians. We're both saved. We're both going to heaven. Maybe I have more understanding. Maybe I don't. If I do have more understanding, I'm more accountable. With understanding comes accountability. So these are ways that we're being taught how to deal with people accusing other people in a church. Finally, in verse 21, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angel that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing in partiality. So he's saying, Timothy, as a pastor, I don't care if your friend, your close personal friend on one side of this issue. When you deal with it, Timothy, when you wade into this issue, you don't take your friend's side because he's your friend. You do it without partiality. 
You try to find the truth. And when you're dealing with friends, that can be difficult. But when you're a church leader, it's expected of you. That's what he's saying. And then uh, let me close the verse. Oh, I already did. I, I found verse 21 interesting. Is I don't know when he's ever, when Paul's ever written anything. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He, yeah, that's Paul talking. And the elect angels? I don't think. That seems like an odd statement in the sense that I don't remember Paul ever uh, including in these kinds of uh, teachings the elect angels. That thou observe these things without preferring one above another. I tell you, we hate it when sheriffs, when deputies, when politicians, when whoever goes after those who they disagree with. Instead, I'm going after whoever breaks the law. And um, just like Paul's telling Timothy, on a smaller scale, this is just church, not the entire country. But God has let us know he ain't like that. When you prefer one above another, you condemn one for doing something, you uh, excuse the other for doing the same thing. Uh, God does not like that.